1619. You know, and I don't see her in the audience, but three years ago, our national president, Sherry Camp, asked me to chair Arts for 100th Commemoration Commission. As an organization, we weren't quite sure where we were going with this, but I knew where I wanted to end with this. And it's amazing when you think three years back how we were hearing about something that none of us knew anything about. We were hearing about things that was opposite to what we learned in school, whether it was elementary, middle, high school, or college. And look at us today, odds is on the forefront of changing a national narrative. Who would have thought odds family? We did this meeting by meeting, conference by conference, conversation by conversation, chapter meeting by chapter meeting, and we changed a national narrative. We didn't do it because it was easy. We did it because it was hard. We didn't do it because we wanted to. We did it because our ancestors spoke to us. 1619. So 1619, 2019, 400 years later, we changed a national narrative. Who would have thought we would have been able to do that? Who knew we now know? So on all of those early presentations, you all heard me say, who knew? Who knew this? Who knew that? Who knew we had all this documentation? Who knew that we would find out who our ancestors were? Who knew we would find their names? And we now know. And that's where we're going from this point forward, we now know. We're changing that national narrative. We're changing a narrative that when we go back to our communities, we will no longer be challenged by what documentation we have. We now challenge them, what documentation do you have? Who knew, we now know. We know we, those first documented in, uh, uh, Africans, when they called them the 20 odd Negroes, there was a reason they were called that because we were not supposed to know who they were. We were not supposed to know their name. Because if you don't know their name, they're an object. But we know that they came from Angola, and we know, not only that, we know that they came from Kambasa, Angola. The rich fertile grounds of the, the B Plateau, that's where they came from. These are almost the ancestors of almost every single person in this room. You're related to at least one of them. Who knew? We now know. They were enslaved because they wanted that land because it sat on top of silver mines. They had conducted business with them for over 200 years but they weren't worth anything when they found out that silver underneath them. They were enslaved. They were shackled. These were the smartest people of Kabasi and Goa. They were the merchants. They were the educators. They were the foreign born. Many of them had gone to Europe to study. But they had to take them out first to get that land and to control those people. They went to the slave pens in Luna, Angola, and they were branded. We know that. They were enslaved. They were put on one of the first ships to leave the San Juan Bautista. We know that. There is so much documentation out there now. We know that documentation is in Angola. We know it's in Spain. We know it's in Portugal. We know it's in Jamaica. We know documentation is even in Veracruz, um, New Spain, which is present-day Mexico. We know it's even here in Virginia. We know that documentation. We know that it's in England. We know that it's in Bermuda. There is so much information about this particular ship and those particular people, the San Juan Bautista. And you know, many of you, we talk about this, 
And you know, I tell people, I not only know where I came from, I know what city they lived in, I know what country they lived in, I know when they left, I know what ship they were on, and I know how they came here. And this is the San Juan Bautista that our ancestors came over on. Look how small it is. Look how tiny it is. Imagine how they felt to be cramped in the belly of that ship. This is the ship of our ancestors. Who knew, we now know. This ship was actually built in Japan. The emperor of Japan thought about making his island nation Christian. So he had the ship built so he could travel around the world to see if this was something he was interested in. And when he decided he wasn't interested, he sold the ship to Spain. That's the mothership. The ship sailed for many nights. And these wealthy Angolans were used to those harsh conditions. And within weeks, over a hundred died. They stopped in Jamaica. I talked to a young lady yesterday, and she said she was from Jamaica, and we hoped to find out whether or not one of our ancestors was left over there. In my mother's DNA, we're finding relatives in Jamaica going back eight, nine, ten generations, which means that a brother, a son, was left in Jamaica, and others came here. 24 young boys were sold so the rest of them could make it. And after they left Angola, the ship was headed to Veracruz, New Spain, present-day Mexico. And as the ship captain overlooked him over his back, what he found was two pirate ships rapidly approaching thinking that his heavy ship with enslaved men, women, and children contained gold and silver. They fought for two hours. And at the end, they took the 60 healthiest men, women, and children and put them on two slave ships. We now know. That first ship arrived on August 25th. 1619 at Point Comfort, present-day Hampton, Virginia. We now know. We know so much today that we didn't know three years ago. And we changed a national narrative, again, not because it was easy, but because it was hard. We know that they were captured in January 1619 in the Catholic area of Cabasa, Angola. We know they were Catholic. How about that? We know they were enslaved and taken to Luna, Angola to be shipped to Veracruz, New Spain, present-day Mexico. We know that. We know that 350 enslaved Angolans boarded the Spanish slave of the San Juan Bautista. We now know that. We know that 100 or so died in route on that ship and stopped in Jamaica for supplies and medicine. And after a short stay, it departed for its final port of call. And we know that they were kidnapped by two English pirate ships and then came to Virginia, then Bermuda. We know that. And we know that because in 1997, Engels Luda found in the Portuguese archives, and this started all of this rich research and this article is written in William and Mary Quarterly in 1997. We know that. So if we know that since 1997, please tell me why people keep telling us we don't know this information. How is that possible? We didn't do this because it was easy. We did this research because it was hard. Some historians still profess we don't know their names. We're tired of these false narratives because we now know. We know so much now. So when I used to say we knew, we now know. 
We know that in the 1623 census, now I make sure I say this correctly, in the 1623 census that was in Virginia, those named Goldlands were listed. Who knew? We now know. And as you can see the red frame, you'll see some of them were unnamed individuals. But some of them had names like Anthony and William and John and Anthony. That's in the 1623 census. So why after 400 years do they say we don't know who they were? This is coming directly out of the Virginia archives. Angelo, Edward, Jairo, Anthony, Margaret, Margaret, Francis, Peter, Antonio, Isabella. These are our ancestors. We know their names. It makes it hard when you know someone's name to treat them something other than a human being. We now know. You know, when I started doing my genealogical research back in the 70s, I had no idea where this was going to take me. I had no idea that when I went into a library and I would put my hand on a book, and I didn't know all those millions of books in the library why my hand went on that book, and I found information on my ancestors. They were speaking to me. My research for the last 30 some years, I didn't do it because it was easy, I did it with, because it was hard. Because I knew my ancestors were speaking to me. And when I tell people that the ghost of my ancestors will have me walk up to a particular area in a big library, you all as genealogists, you know what that is, right? We don't know why our ancestors talked, ancestors talked to us. There was trouble and they wanted to be free. You know, I've done a lot of research, and someone else in this room, Catherine Knight's done a lot of research, and we disagree a little bit on some of the names of those original Angolans, because in 1619, that those two ships came, the White Line and the Treasurer, but 10 years later, another ship came with 100 uh, Angolans from the same area called the Fortune. But we know their names from 1619 to 2019. Who knew, we now know. You know, when Martin Luther started in the 60s, he didn't do it because it was easy, he did it because it was hard but he spoke for the people. Malcolm spoke to the people. And 1619 has now allowed us to speak for ourselves. How about that? So when someone says to you what is 1619 about, this is what it's about. We can now speak for ourselves. We now have control over our narrative. It's allowed us for 400 years to correct the narrative. That's what 1619 is all about. It's helping us now build new narratives for our children. So they don't read those books that we read. We know they left Angola as enslaved people for the San Juan Bautista, and they were to be enslaved. But when they arrived on the shores of Virginia, they also were meant to be enslaved. But that was not their fate. Now you all heard my many presentations, so I don't need to go into why that wasn't their fate, because you know that. So I'm kind of doing this as an overview for some of you who aren't aware, but that was not their fate. When historians want you to, want to perpetuate a false narrative, they will write and they will say, the Africans were slaves, 
And if you don't believe our lies, what's your proof? Have you been there? If you don't believe our lies, what's your proof? Nobody knows their names because they weren't important enough. But for somehow, while my hands reach out to those books and bring the life of my ancestors, I don't know why those librarians can't go to those same books and find those same names. Now, some of you have heard this story, and I told you those who have, I'm going to wear this in the ground until I'm buried in it. That's right. But we were told that they were slaves because their skin was black in color. You hear me, Ox family? Mm -hmm. Now, something else I'll wear until I go into my grave. I'm from Boston. And I can hear some of the stuff that unfortunately some of you heard until May of 2019. I heard something so repugnant that I will go to my grave and repeat this story over and over and over again. Some believe there are still open questions. Were they African slaves or were they free? Now, I don't like calling them Africans because to me that's disrespectful. They were Angolans. We don't call them English Europeans. We call them English. We need to call them Angolans. We need to correct that narrative. Do we know where they were or have been or have they been lost to history? Now, I went to Jamestown Settlement. And I don't see Evelyn here. She's here. She'll, but you all heard how I went there in March and there was one hole and they said it was Angela's house. And I went there in April and there was a second hole and they said it was Angela's house. And I went in May and there was a third hole and they said it was Angela's house. Now I was, and then I asked them, when did Angela buy this house? Now, Angela was one of these first Angolans. But see, there's so much money to be made off of our story today that Jamestown concocted this phenomenal story about Angela's house. I asked what room did she live in because the, there was no larger than this piece right here. And then I said, did she live with Captain Pierce, whose house it was? Made him feel uncomfortable. I said, where was Mrs. Pierce if Angela lived here? <laughs> Made him real uncomfortable. But when I went there in May, <coughs> they were given this real fantastic story under a big tree with the Jamestown River in the background. About 35, 40 people sitting in a semicircle. And having driven for two and a half, three hours, I didn't feel like sitting, so I stood as this young man, whose name I won't give, because it's really not him, it's the organization, gave this story. And building on a false narrative in plain sight, didn't even try to hide it and said the Africans were slaves because their skin was black, representing dark, ugly, and represented evil. Oh, if you haven't heard this story before, you're not tied into the Bob's Facebook page because it's been all over the place. Come on, folks. And he said that the English were slaves because their skin was white, which represented purity and beauty. He then went on to say, there were five African princesses who saw the beauty of white skin, so they wanted to go north to become white and beautiful. I was so shocked. I mean, I really was. I had, I had heard people tell me stuff like that, but I never witnessed something like that. It took me a long time to respond. Two seconds. <laughs> No, you laugh. Two seconds. I had never been anywhere 
to hear something like that before. And I called him out. Now, when I was a little kid in kindergarten, I had a traumatic experience. I had my tonsils taken out. And I was down his throat like bad tonsils. <laughs> I shared this story with, with the Odds Executive Board, and I'm telling you, your leadership was phenomenal. We wrote a letter. That letter's been circulating all over the internet. <coughs> and we got a response. And what happened with the response, before we got the written response, I got a phone call from the chairwoman of Virginia Discovery. And as a good chairperson, she wanted me to believe that my lying ears didn't hear what I heard. <laughs> and I let her continue with the conversation for about two seconds. <laughs> and I said to her, if that's the narrative you want to put out there, we will allow you 14 days with that narrative. And then I didn't say anything. And she came back after about 45 seconds of silence and says, what happens after 14 days? <laughs> I said, you're assuming that there's no tape recording of it. That caught her by surprise. Because at that point, they don't want to be out there saying it never happened to have a tape come forward. So our national president, Gene Stevenson, got a letter back from them. Now, I, I don't like to talk this way, but I'm from Boston. <laughs> Those dummies weren't smart enough to write a better letter than what they did. Because what they did was, they wrote a letter and doubled down on the comment that was made. And not only did they double down on the comment that was made, now this is a historical institution grounded in research, wrote a letter back and said that the comment was based on a 1605 play. <laughs> did you hear what I just said? I want to make sure that, you did, that your ears didn't it was based on a 1605 play. We don't even know if they liked that play in 1605. <laughs> we don't even know if the play was condemned. But the name of the play was called The Mask of Blackness, where the Queen of Denmark, who was married to the King of England, had all of her queens, ladies in waiting, paint their face black. And that was the basis of this play and the basis of this 400-year-old narrative that they're still telling in May of 2019 that Rick Murphy happened to walk upon. So you see what I mean about these false narratives? They get called on it. And now they're trying to walk away from what they have in writing, but our director of public relations was so good, she put that on Facebook, and it is all over the world now. So if you haven't seen it, go to the Odds web page, because you will be shocked what's in that letter. And unfortunately, we've allowed that narrative for 400 years that we were, our, our ancestors were enslaved because their skin was black because of a 1605 play. It's not even real. Our ancestors, those Angolans, they were some smart people. And they didn't want us to know how smart they were. Now those of you who were here yesterday, you heard me talk about Paul Heineck, and you heard me say that that man is my hero. Now, I'm going to get raw about this. Because I think when I come to the end, you will understand why I feel the need. I was all night long thinking about this. But Paul, a European-American, 
married to an African-American woman, he did not need to do what he did. He could have played golf. <laughs> there are a whole bunch of things that he could have done other than research our ancestors. His wife's ancestors spoke to him through her. No one has done what he did prior to the work of Paul Heine. And no one has done anything since the work of Paul Heine. And every now and then I will hear someone say, well, something's not quite right in the book. Then if it's not right, let him know so he can fix it. We need to move beyond the period of saying what's wrong and make something right. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And Paul did that for us. You're historians. You're genealogists. You know what he did. You know how hard it is. And he didn't do it because it was easy. He did it because it was hard. The English came here in 1607 up into the 1640s and 1650s. They were the peasants of England because nobody wanted to come here unless they wanted to buy land. They couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't compute. But those Anglo-Ones could do all of that. And the reason why Paul was able to find what he did is because they sued. They sued for their land, they sued for their animals, and they legally made sure that their children were indentured. So when you hear Paul and others talk about how they own thousands and thousands of acres of land, excuse me, your ancestors, who knew? We now know. And what they wanted to do is as they died one by one, they looked at each and every one of their accomplishments. And they turned them around, and that was the basis of the 1705 slave codes. Their accomplishments were turned around and enslaved the rest of us because they wanted to make sure that none of us were able to do what they did. They could read and write. They could have passed the law you can't read or write. Anthony Johnson, with his tobacco, sent for poor Englishmen to come over and work for him. And every person who came over, he got 50 acres of a head right, and that's how he got all his land. And they made sure it never happened again. My Gowen cousins, we know that John Gowen raised animals, and we wanted to make sure that his son wouldn't be enslaved. He sold his animals, and they said no other African can do that again. I will show you those slave codes. But they came from the accomplishments of our enslaved ancestors. Who knew? We now know. And each and every one of these slave codes came directly from the accomplishments of those first document in Goans. And when you read my book, you'll see how it was possible. Who knew? We now know. Chile. Can you believe that? And you'll notice that last one, that if you could read, you had to register with the parish, what do you think happened after that? <laughs> the international slave trade. 360,000 Africans were brought directly to the United States back then, English North America. They primarily went to Georgia, Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina, and a few of the other states.
And historians want to talk about the international slave trade. We need to stop that. Don't allow them to talk about the international slave trade. It was brutal, it was harsh, it stripped men of all dignity, forced them to talk about the domestic slave trade. Between 835,000 and 1.5 million African Americans in this country were sold south, where the big money was made. We passed the 1705 slave codes so we could rip people apart in our own country, the Southern South. So those of you who come from Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, Louisiana, you know what you all are finding out? Remember what I told you a couple of years ago? Start doing your DNA and you'll find out that your roots start back in Virginia, North Carolina, and that's what you all are finding. They rip families apart. Am I telling the truth? Why? Who thought? Who knew? We now know. This is what James Horn, president of the Jamestown Rediscovery, wrote. I cannot emphasize enough that these words were not the opinions of the tour guide, but a direct reference to a 1605 play, The Master Bass Blackness, sponsored by Anne of Denmark. Queen of James I of England. Extracts from the play are quoted to illustrate the racialized thinking and negative stereotypes of Africans already existed in the early 17th century, even before the arrival of the first enslaved Africans. And then he goes on to say, these are repugnant words. These are repugnant words, and why did they use them? We now know. But this is what we read in school. And guess what? This book is still being used in Virginia. Life among the Negroes of Virginia in slavery times is generally happy. The Negroes went about in a cheerful manner making a living for themselves and for those whom they were. They were not so unhappy as some northerners thought they were, nor were they so unhappy as southerners claimed. But they were not worried about the furious arguments going on between northerners and southerners over what should be done with them. In fact, they paid little attention to these arguments. This is in the schools today. Can you imagine? Who knew? We now know. And we know that the feeling of strong affection existed between masters and slaves in the majority of Virginian homes was not true. We're historians and genealogists. We're changing this narrative not because it's easy, but because it's hard. A strong tie existed between the slave and the master because each was dependent on the other. The regard that master and slaves had for each other made plantation life happy and prosperous. We are changing that narrative, not because it's easy, because we know it's going to be hard. That's what 16, 19, 2019 is all about. Yesterday, as people were talking, we heard people ask questions and make statements. We're changing the narrative. You all are doing this. Three years ago when we started this, no one believed anything we had to say and they challenged you. And now they're eating their words. 42 million Americans of African descent descend from those original 360,000 Africans who came here. You see their faces. But we're also seeing faces of white Americans who are also now finding out through DNA that they are descending from those very first Africans. Who knew? We now know. Before, when we were in this struggle by ourselves, we now have partners out there to change this narrative. And many of them have come forward to say they want to help in our struggle to change the narrative so our children don't read those textbooks that we read when we grew up. Yes. We now know. Paul 
all of you so tired of hearing me. <laughs> These are the names of the people that he found in the early 1600s, free people of color. These are your ancestors. Their children and grandchildren were kidnapped and taken south and enslaved. This isn't a discussion about free people were better than enslaved people. And let's make sure we don't make that mistake. Because the free people had to fight to survive for themselves, and the enslaved people had to work to make the others rich. Who knew? We now know. My hero yesterday had a whole bunch of pictures up there. And I had to put a picture up here myself. Now, you always hear me say that we're all related to one another. Anybody related to this person here? Who's related to Medea? Now, I know you all know who Medea is. And if I ask you to raise your hand, if you knew, I know, I know you all intellectuals weren't going to raise your hand, but I know you know who Medea is. <laughs> but there's some of Medea in each and every one of us. You know, Paul talked yesterday about how these all lawsuits, and I told you how when our young kids say they're going to sue somebody, we say we didn't get it from them. I said, well, for 400 years, they've been practicing. <laughs> but this comes to the next chapter in our life. This is where we're going to go. This is the important part of this discussion. Because while I have a picture of Medea up here to add a little levity, it helps to transition. And I know it better to ask who saw the next movie, oh, yeah. Family Reunion. <laughs> but that is, this is what it's going to be about. This is the next chapter. For the first time ever, it's never been done in this country for 400 years. It's never been done in this country for 400 years. Odds is going to bring the original families and their descendants together. Next year at our annual conference, we are going to have a national family reunion. We want the descendants of America's first documented Africans. We want all of you to have a family reunion because we want to do something that was never done before, not because it's easy, because it's hard. It's never been done before. Not only are we taking back our narrative, we're bringing our kinfolk back home. Our theme, Virginia, where African American roots run deep, correcting the national narrative. We're going to be seeking collaborations from national historical societies, national geological societies, DNA companies, educational organizations, federal, state, and local governments. Whatever they have on us, we want them to open those vaults up. Let me make sure that you all understand what we're talking about. No longer are we going to allow them to have records in their vaults for 400 years that could have corrected this narrative and changed our lives and not have come out in 2019 when they knew about that in 1623. Open up that information. When you go back to your communities, you tell those national, historical, those national and local historical societies, whatever you have, make it available. Geological societies, whatever you have, make it available. DNA companies, stop making money off of us, bring it back home. 
Yeah. And the cancer organization began to change their narrative. And federal and state and local governments pony up. Yeah. <laughs> We're changing the narrative. Corporate America. Pop up those Benjamins. <laughs> Do you hear me? I hear you. We're going to be working with the Virginia Department of Tourism, the Department of Humanities, State, the Virginia State Library, the Virginia Department of Education, and the Department of Film Industry. We're having a national reunion. We're coming home. Those, we're going to do family documentaries. We're having initial discussions with folks in Hollywood, and they are interested. You hear me? If you got a cousin out there, tell them come here. If you know Medea, tell them come here. We're going to do documentaries. Because if your family story comes, bring it home. Help your unknown relatives Find home. Tell your family stories visually. Share your family photos. Identify a location of family graves and share your databases. Come home, Virginia. The New York Times has written a phenomenal article. The Washington Post has written articles. The Boston Globe. Who would have thought three years ago that the national media would embrace this? Who knew? We now know. And all the hard work that you all did, not because it was easy, because it was hard. And they're now telling our story for us. Come home, Virginia. If you came late, you weren't here when I said, take out your cell phones. Go to Google. And what I want you to do, and you'll ask me this two or three times, so I'm more than happy to do it. In Google, I want you to type USA space today, space, slave, graphic. This is what I want you to take back home, Odds family. And I'm going to take you to that graphic, but I want to make sure you have it on your phone so you can go home. So you're going to go to Google, USA, space, today, space, slave, space, graphic. And this is what you're going to start to see. So you all always ask me, I need something to take back home. I need to take it to my kids. I need to take it to my grandkids. I need to take it to Aunt Sally. I need to take it to my sister. You're going to have it. And this is what the newspapers are now doing. They're taking your story, Odds Family. USA Today, newspaper, slave, graphic. I want you to have this odds family, and I want you to go back to your communities and say you changed the national narrative. You now have the newspapers telling your story, a story that they wouldn't have told three years ago. Come home, Virginia. Who doesn't have it? Do I want somebody to help them. If you don't have it, put your hand up. Don't be ashamed, because I need to make sure, odds family, that you have this. Yeah. USA, space, today, Slave graphic. And again, that picture represents 10 million pixels for every one of our ancestors who was enslaved. Can you see it up on the screen here? Yes. They're talking about the San Juan Bautista. We 
we were in a big country and we were some small voices when we started this three years ago. There's 143 that they expected had died at sea. In July, they went to Jamaica and traded 24 young boys so that the rest could live. And some of us are finding in our DNA those Jamaican relatives. Who would have known? We're actually finding those brothers who were left behind in Jamaica. Who would have thought? We're even now finding people in Mexico with them too. So the ones that weren't left in Jamaica, weren't left here in Virginia, were taken to Mexico. We're finding them. Who knew? We now know. To send chills down your spine to see this in big print, a national newspaper covering it. They've got a graphic of it. Think of the money they spent to do this. Come up with those Benjamins. The 32. A journey that led to death or slavery. Look at this graphic. For every 1,000 who were kidnapped, 640 survived. That's just to the interior, to the coast. The 570 who, of that 1,000 who were placed on the waiting slave ship only 400 lived to see the Americas, less than half. What a waste of human talent. Those who landed here in Virginia, look at this growth. Where they went. And the thousand who were here, and now we come back to the graphic. those two black faces at least one of those pixels is your ancestor for some of us our fondest memories were at grandma's house for some of us we remember those Thanksgiving dinners and at the time, we didn't realize how important those few precious moments were. But whenever we think back to the good old days, somehow it comes back to Grandma. And Grandma, who lived on limited resources, would scrape her last pennies to buy the turkey, the vegetables, the potatoes, the sweet potatoes, the dessert, because she wanted her family to come home. And when the smart out daughter-in-law says, well, is there something I can do? <laughs> Grandma's been cooking too long, and she says, you've been coming here for 20 years. If it needs to be done, do it. And those of you who are grandmas today, am I saying it right? Yes. If it needs to be done, do it. We need your help to make this reunion come together. <coughs> Don't ask us what needs to be done. Do it. We want 
want you there, state libraries and state archives. We want you there, state and local historical societies. We want you there, national geological societies. We want you there, lineage societies. We want you there, military organizations. We want you there, historically black colleges. We want you there, trade unions. And if you have information on our people, we want you there. Don't ask us what needs to be done. Do it. You hear me? Yeah. And when they asked you, you said, whatever you have, do it, because that's what we want. We want 1,000 people there. We want 1,500 people there. We want to come home, Virginia. If you're a descendant of the first documented African, if you know your descendant from 1619, please stand. 1620 Angola. Come on, stand. I want the descendants to stand across the room. They know that they descend from 1619. Stand. If you can trace your ancestry to any time from 1600 to 1700, stand. Look at that. Come on, Virginia. If you can trace your ancestry to the Revolutionary War, stand, Virginia. Thank you, family. Thank, Thank you. you.